Welcome back to another episode of Energy 101. It has been a hot minute since myself and Misty have been in here. So stoked to be back. I don't know if anyone saw Julie's post, but we're coming back with a vengeance. So get ready. We are. I'm I was honestly surprised at how many people wanted to help. So many. Why didn't we do that sooner? I don't know. Well, it's too easy, I guess. We so unintentionally. Unintentionally. Because Life, it's really work. hard to get people to come on. Um yep. Plus, mm-hmm. when we're we're like all the executors that are in the business, yeah, we have a real really job here <laughs> to do both. I mean, as you know, so we're trying to do the same thing. That's funny. JP Warren, you know, yeah. JP too. He's doing the same thing. He was yep. doing podcasts, and they took a break, and mm-hmm. he called me. So I'm a first back on two oh, big yeah. time Congrats. podcasts this week. Wow, oh, special! <laughs> I love it. I yeah. love it. Yeah, he uh, we he was on our platform, and then he just took it under his umbrella of uh, oh, really? connection crew yeah oh yeah, yeah. i okay. mean yeah it works so that's exciting for him yeah exciting for us so speaking <laughs> of our first guest back brett do you want to introduce yourself <laughs> yes sir uh yes. i'm brett shell uh ceo of cobalt technology new houston transplant almost fresh american great Not quite yet welcome yeah, yeah. wait i love i feel like you're more texan than most texans in houston uh, that's what I get told a lot. Yeah, yeah like I'm, you, you belong <laughs> in like West Texas. <laughs> Please get me out there. Wherever it's yeah. like the freest with the most guns, and yes. everybody wants to talk about politics. Yep, that's me. You're yeah. there. Yeah. Mid- Midland, Texas is calling your name. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love it. I escaped Canada. I'm very thankful to be here. Yeah. So how yeah. long have you been here? A couple of years. Oh, okay. I, I was living in the Marriott downtown for a couple of years, basically on off and on, and then yeah. I got a house uh, in was it Clear Lake? Mm-hmm. Uh, league city mm-hmm. i didn't i just looked on a map and i didn't really ever go there and i'm like oh that's not too far it's funny yeah. you say that because <laughs> crystal on our team the same thing happened to her she moved from japan um and she also lives in clear lake because she bought it when they were over there saw it on a map and was like that doesn't seem too far mm-hmm. now she hates her life <laughs> right, drives, an hour. drives an hour to work every day traffic. it's so bad because when you're not from Houston, you don't understand yeah. the traffic mm-hmm. and the distances. Yeah. And Clear Lake kind of looks nice because there's always lakes and it's right. Water. You're like, this is you're the like, best. Right. It's mm-hmm. great. No. <laughs> and you got there direct surprise. I was like trying to tell people, like, well, come out here. And they're like, no, I'm not coming out there. Yeah, it's way too far. <laughs> yeah. No thanks. So now I live in the Heights, which is like 10 minutes away. Which is perfect. Good. No, Me too. Good yeah. I'm a Heights bitch for life. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. So um, should we get into it? So I think today we're going to talk about. Um, your roughnecking experience in Canada, because we're all very interested. Um, I'm I'm wondering if we'll have any more questions since Colin came on and he explained everything to us. So um, I think like the difference will be how it is in Canada, because we only know how it is in you know Texas. Mm-hmm. I mean, he worked in other places, but when he was a roughneck, it was in West Texas. Um, and yeah, there's a big difference between that and Canada. Mm-hmm. So what year or how old were you when you started roughnecking? I think that's exactly right. But I think like 23. 23. And did you, were you like born and raised like in oil and gas? No. 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 So I was born in a small town and then I dropped out in grade 12. Kind of, I didn't really technically finish. Like I didn't get all my credits and everything, but Mm -hmm. my assistant principal, he really liked me. So he's like, I was like, can I just have like the. Harry Potter outfit and go to the thing with everybody and get my pictures. And he's like, yeah, I don't care. So he gave me things. <laughs> on, yeah, like kind of Colin graduated. are exactly <laughs> <laughs> you all the same person. <laughs> really? Did he do that too? I mean, yeah, he barely gra- – like I don't know – I don't know how he ended up like talking the, into letting him graduate because he wasn't supposed to either. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. basically I didn't have this stuff. I didn't really care if I did graduate. Yeah. So technically I didn't. I didn't get my thing. Yeah. But they let me have the paper. They put my name on it and I got my pictures and I went on the stage. Great. And the, the principal was like, okay, I don't care. Mm-hmm. Did it for show. Yeah. For your mom. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everybody got to come. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I basically dropped out of left and I went to art school in Vancouver because I'm an artist and that's what I love mm-hmm. to do. And there's a great school there where I got accepted into it. And so I started doing that and I realized pretty quick, I'm like, All my friends, this is like early 2000s, where 100 grand a year was a lot of money. Yeah. Like you're rich. And so all my friends were on drilling rigs. This is in the boom of Alberta, Canadian oil and gas. Gotcha. And so they were all making 100, 150 grand a year, some 200 grand a year. And I'm like making nothing painting pictures. Yeah. (laughs) And that's how I ended up in the oil field. (laughs) I wanted an Escalade, so I quit and left. That's so interesting because I feel like going and working on a rig is 
a lot different than painting pictures <laughs> a lot more rough was it like a hard um culture oh, yeah. shock <laughs> yeah. oh yeah. yeah i had like no discipline no like i was oh, just you're like, like a free spirit you're very creative and yeah. yeah yeah and so but my sister was dating a guy who was a driller out there and he came and we got along really good and i liked him but he was a hard ass and mm. i kind of like respected that about him i'm like oh this guy i can be friends because he's kind of cool and then he's like, you can come out to the rig for sure and make hundred grand a year, like right away. And I was like, let's do it. That's easy. Just bought all my hard hat, my little club coveralls, and I'll just go out there and just screw around and make some money. <laughs> <laughs> How was your first day? Oh, uh, terrible. It was scary. It's honestly scary. Like you're, you don't, and that doesn't really sit in until you're driving for eight hours in the middle of nowhere. And then the yeah. truck's going down the dirt road and all of a sudden this giant machine is just there and you don't I don't know like I don't know what a Derek is I don't know what anything is mm -hmm. and then there's five guys there that all have worked together for years and they're like brothers mm -hmm. and they're the, you're the guy and that, you're the new guy mm -hmm. that they're trying to run off yes <laughs> that's it and it's like a I think it's a lot different now uh you're not allowed to do like trial by initiation mm -hmm. but it was very much like you are not part of this crew you don't get to eat you don't mm -hmm. get to go on the you know you don't sit where we sit you don't change and it's rude and it's hard and it's on purpose. It's deliberate because they don't want soft people out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They want guys that can take it, will hack it and put it in. They all had to go through it. Right. So it's like, you have to do this. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. How long did you work out there? Uh, so I was supposed to do it for like a, I, my plan, classical field plan is like a year or two. Yeah. Make enough money to buy a cool car and a little bit of cash and then go do whatever I'm going to do. And it was like six years almost seven and then my brother-in-law got hired to go and i got hired to go to build rigs for another company and so then i was there for a little while and then they started promoting us and doing it and then i'm like when we got offered promotions there i was like yeah, i'm out of here like, yeah. yeah the day they offered me the promotion i quit yeah because it's like you have this like moment like, yeah. yeah you're like am i gonna do this the rest of my life yeah it's very hard to leave and that's a lot of the problem in midland people don't leave midland because it's so hard to leave the money yeah, you got to be careful because there's a trap. Like a lot of people say this about oil and gas guys, like a running joke, yeah. like the riggers that make the money and they spend all the money and then they're in that cycle. It's true. I think a lot of it because we don't get, like I didn't grow up with any education around money. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you get your money, you buy assets, you depreciate them, you buy houses, you get passive right. income. No one talked about that. It's just like you get a job and you make 50% of what your money is, the rest goes to the government and then you buy shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, and that's know, it. Yeah. That's yeah. it. That's it. And then the, the trap is, I don't think these guys are so much worse than anybody else, but the life is that you go away for three quarters of your life and you live it on a rig in the middle of a field and you don't see anybody. You miss all the dinners. You miss all the birthdays. You miss all the weekends. You miss mm -hmm. everything. And you're stuck on this rig. And then you get one week off to come back. And it's like, I'm going jet skiing. I'm going boating. I'm going taking my family to Disneyland. I'm going mm -hmm. up, yeah. up, 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 mm -hmm. up, and try and cram life into a week. And that's where all the money goes. Yeah. Unless you're like, you do drugs. <laughs> well, <laughs> then the money goes that, out. Yeah. 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 But I wasn't that. So, but, yeah. but it does. I like, I have sympathy and empathy for that, you know, that yeah. kind of perspective mm -hmm. gets put on them because they are, you're trying to cram life into a week. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So you worked, what, two weeks on, one week off? Yeah. Two weeks on, one week off and on a drilling rig. And so I did a lot of, like what Colin, what did Colin tell you? He, where did he do? I don't even really know. He was drilling rigs. Yeah. So he was a roughneck for, I want to say, Four years. Um, he actually broke out on a Canadian rig. So his crew was pretty much all Canadians. Um, and he worked his way up to maybe a Derek Hand, or maybe he was about to get promoted. And then yeah. he went into services. Oh, yeah. He went into wireline after that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh like I don't need to go into all the details of that, but the lifestyle and everything. You were you you were dating. So I man? no, we were okay during that time. We had we were dating. We had just moved in together. We got pregnant with our first kid. Um. So the two week on, two week off was I was pregnant and you know had our first son, and then when it went into wireline, it was very much a twenty four seven on call. So I would prefer. The two week he actually worked four weeks on, two weeks off. He did two weeks of days, two weeks of nights, two weeks off. So the two weeks of nights like That's rough. absolutely sucked. Like I yeah. never yeah. saw him. Yeah. He came home. He just slept all day. I had to stay quiet. Um, so that sucked. But I I actually talked about this on the last podcast. I don't think people realize how much 
of a work ethic is passed on to the families of oil field hands because I everything I did I had to do by myself I had to find figure out how to move furniture put things together like do everything take care of everything so on our days off we could just enjoy each yeah. other it wasn't mm-hmm. like he came home and you had a build list a of things to do yeah, yeah. I, I, could, I couldn't have like a honeydew list and it's bled into how we live our lives now which a lot of people I don't think understand yeah it's very traditional in a sense but at the same time it's like it's what we had to do to survive that. Right. Like, mm-hmm. And it's it's honestly nice not depending on anyone. <laughs> Whenever you like want to get something done, you want to get it done. You don't want to wait for two weeks off to finish this project. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Families don't, I mean, people don't realize that on the wives, that's just like oil the, field wives. That's the task side of things too. That's not like the emotional and mental exactly, side. Exactly. Yeah. Like you're alone all the time. All the time with the kids. Like, there's no, like, calling for help or, hey, come watch the kids, anything like that. So, yeah, and ours were very little at that time. And when he was, I think when I had three, they were all, like, four and under. That's when he was on call. And that's whenever, like, no days off. There was no for sure days off. Sure, he might be home for a week, but he could be gone the next day. So, that was tough. Yeah. And it was a transition for when he quit his job and was home all the time, like, it's very, very different. Are you guys involved with like anyone that has that's in the oil field or has been oil field? No. Mm-hmm. no, nope. Okay. Don't ever do it. <laughs> no, I. Uh, <laughs> a lot. I'm from Florida. I'm not even from Texas, so I had no idea. So you did alligator farmers, right? <laughs> no. And drug dealers. <laughs> yeah. We have we do bath salts and gators. Um, no, but I didn't. I don't think people outside of where oil fields are, anyone that's working in energy it's not talked about in other, like it was never a topic of conversation in Florida. You like maybe hear it on the news, but even then I still don't think unless like your parents are really into politics, no one knows where electricity comes from. No one knows where gas comes from or nothing. That's crazy. Yeah. But it's true. Like even like Alberta where I live is kind of like the Texas of Canada. I didn't know that Canada did oil. Didn't know it either. Nope. Recently. No idea. <laughs> Canada used to do a lot more oil. We got pretty liberal governments now, so yeah. we're squishing the whole thing. But there's a lot up there. There's, yeah. But it's kind of different. It's like there's some unconventional and there's some tar sand stuff. Anyway, it's all technical stuff. doesn't matter. But it, I lived in a town that was like a few hours from where like West Texas would be where all the Midland, that's where yeah. all the action is. Houston, people know a lot of oil and gas because there's a lot of the headquarters here. Right. But if you go outside like Austin and all that, they don't really. Yeah. Right. It's not a thing. So it's crazy. Like, mm-hmm. Because we're in it, we think that people know or just based common sense, you'd know you have to. They really mm-hmm. don't. Yeah. yeah, I know. I didn't either until I got into it. And then when you get into it. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't know <laughs> yeah. what to expect. There's no way you can prepare for it. And it's such an interesting thing to try to tell people. But yeah. Well, and it's it's interesting to to be on the inside and to realize like how big the industry really is. We talk about it all the time mm-hmm. as not just oil production, but like the petrochemicals, everything, almost everything that you touch daily mm-hmm. is somehow related, made from petrochemicals. Mm-hmm. Like it's insane. Yeah. We had a downstream person on last week. I've never learned about downstream at all because being from Midland, it's up, like, is it upstream? Upstream, upstream yeah. is all I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so it's just interesting that there's so there's mm-hmm. so many parts of downstream. There's and this is just oil and gas. Then you mm-hmm. have all the other verticals. It's it's wild, and that's why we started this so we can try to learn yeah. more. But I what, will say it's very hard to learn where when you can't go and like touch it or yeah. like go out mm-hmm. there and experience it. Like actually look at the rig, actually look at whatever is going in the hole. You know, it's very different being hands on. So I will say that's a little bit mm-hmm. tough, but. You just need to do like add some video to some of these things. I know. Like get clips yeah. so you can show them like a picture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because that makes a big difference. Yeah. But, I mean, getting to see and things. between Canada mm-hmm. and the US, like to your question about what's different about Canadian stuff, mm-hmm. I think obviously, so there's the temperature differences, which make a big difference. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. that's, there's different like schedules. Like we have months in the spring where you can't work. They just, everything shuts down. Oh. It's called breakup. Because it's too cold. Too muddy. Oh, too, too muddy. muddy. Yeah, too oh. soft. Like the ground's too soft because when it thaws out and all the uh, snow okay. melts, oh. the rigs can't drive around because it just sinks into the dirt. 
Mm-hmm. So they're, they're, and they mm-hmm. don't want to wreck all the farmers' roads. So, so there's no drilling at no. all going on during those months. Yeah. So what does wow. that yeah. do? Do people How have do you other get jobs? Paid? No, you don't. You just you don't. Yeah. You go find things. a different job. Yeah, and sometimes break up can. No, usually you work. We so the thing in Canada is you work a lot in the winter as much mm. as you can, like pretty steady. Yeah. The whole time, and then come around like May, April, May, breakup starts, and then so it's called breakup, and then. Breakup. From April, May, June, July, basically to sometimes August, September, depends wow. on when it was. It slowly comes back in August. That's so insane. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. So you get like a few months off in Canada, and but it sometimes turns into like four, three, right. four, and you're waiting for that phone call. And, so you like try to mm-hmm. save? What do you, I feel like, like what do you do? I feel like yeah. I'd run out of money if I didn't get another job. Mm-hmm. Or do you work your days off? Uh, a lot of guys like go farming or something like that if they run out of yeah. cash. A lot you don't like the thing is you work like three months with no days off in minus right. fifty mm-hmm. in dark most of it. So you're just I don't understand. Like I miserable. can't even like <laughs> visualize what that looks like. Mm-hmm. I just picture all these like roughnecks trying to work with like icicles coming down their face. Yeah, and, like just the tears and the spot <laughs> <laughs> things it's coming tears. out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what, there I'll tell you a story. Was so we worked on a rig in Northwest Territories with basically Alaska Mm -hmm. and in the winter there we went and on the way we'd stand a camp so it's like these little trailers you guys have been to a camp here it's like little I mean I think I've seen square atco trailers they got like beds and a bathroom in them and then they just have 40 of them in a row and they just flatten a piece of land and put them out there and that's where they work it's horrible yeah, <laughs> it's, it's as bad as it I'm sounds. like, yeah, I'm like cringing. On yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, so you'll fly like a big plane to whatever city's closest, and then you'll take a truck to a small airport, and then you'll get on some plane. There was planes where one time it was like puttering out on the way there because they're crappy planes that no one ever uses oh to go God. to like the bush. Where it's like, rrr, rrr. you come crashing down. <laughs> right I, the one time one plane shut off in the air and it just started to drop and you have never seen like your rig crew's faces go so white we're all like we all thought we we're gonna die oh for my sure. gosh and then it's just like Rah. so you're already doing a dangerous job <laughs> right yeah it's dangerous you're gonna there. risk my life every day and right. i'm gonna die in a fucking plane crash. yeah yeah so they fly on those crappy planes and then you get in a crew truck and the uh, crew that was working is coming out so you and just, you're like sitting there and you're like bumping next to each other <laughs> yeah it's packed bumping and like praying like at the same time hats all around oh you and gosh. you know you're going to like a siberian work camp for three months it's the worst that's what it sounds like it is basically. siberia yeah, yeah. And so you'll go to the airport and the outcoming crew, you see them. And these are guys that look like they were in World War II. Like, they're like, God, get me out of here. And you're just like, no. You're like, here, cover yourself. Yeah. yeah. And you get and you go to your crappy trailer and you unload your stuff. And then you go and you drive another maybe hour or two out to the rig. And on the in the truck, I remember a lot of times when we were working up there, we'd look at the mirror where it has the temperature thing on the old GMs. And it said minus 58. Mm-hmm. I was just about to ask that. Yeah. And I was just, and you're supposed to shut it down at like minus 30 or something. Like they're oh. not supposed to go past that. That's well, not a thing. They don't care. Yeah. Yeah. That's just like finish drilling, please. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And so minus 58 and you go out there and there was a trick that we all had. So you put on your like four layers and you're like big, you're like a starfish. Like yeah. Like a baby with those things on. <laughs> and you come outside and they just spray you down with the wash gun. Get you wet. Wait, why? Well, because you're probably like, so it's really minus 58 and windy. So the wind chill there, you can't have any skin sticking out. You're going to get frostbite. Yeah, it'll it'll take a minute or two and it'll just like frostbite your skin. So you have to have everything covered and then the wind is still getting through. So you want, you spray yourself down with a water gun for two reasons. One, it makes like an ice layer on all your clothes (laughs) and that stops the wind. And then two, if you're tripping pipe (laughs) and you're on the floor and you're breaking connections, like we said, so they pull the pipe out and they break it off and go to lay it down. All the fluid out of the top pipe spills on you. So it's like wet, it just drips on you. So if you just do the light layer first, it makes that first layer and you don't get it soaking through. Wow. So just build up yeah. and just keep breaking it off. Oh my God. And you can't yeah. go inside for 12 hours. That sounds terrifying. Mm-hmm. Are there like, um, how do I, like heaters? Like, are there any insulation type of things? Like, is it boxed up? Like normal rigs, they're like in West Texas, they're not, there's nothing that really protects you because weather's not that bad. Yeah. But are there like walls? They're the bigger rigs have what they call prefabs. So they'll put up walls around it and they'll have heaters in there and then it's a little more normal. But yeah. I was on like crappy or mm-hmm. little rigs and so no. No, there's nothing. Get out there. That's insane, especially because you just walk outside and you're just going to get frostbite. Mm-hmm. Like, we yeah. always had like the lines all winter yeah. permanently. Mm-hmm. Like you'd go home for Ugh. two weeks and you have these red lines on your cheek. 
from your skin being toasted. Um, <laughs> so what happened when you have to go to the bathroom? Yeah. You do it quick. You go in the cellar. So underneath okay. the rig floor, there's like heated box. It's all that's prefabbed in to keep this like where the bowl and everything okay, warm. Good, good, good. And so you go down there. Okay. Yeah. Or there's bathrooms, but you go quick so that your clothes don't melt. Because if you go in the shack or swarm, <laughs> they start melting and then you're screwed. Oh my gosh. I have like a newfound respect for Canadian rough <laughs> I know. That's I feel insane. like there should be some, you know, like that show Naked and Afraid. Like I feel like there needs to be some sort of like survivor S. Yes. <laughs> Last for a week, on the Canadian yeah. Rig. yeah, in the dead of winter. Yeah, well, and the, like in the there's cross shifts there, so you usually do two or three weeks in kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then our two of our guys on our cross shift quit last minute, and so mm-hmm. they're they fly them in. There's no one else. You'd have to say you can't leave. Yeah. So okay. then we just did three nights of or three weeks of nights. So we didn't saw sun for like six weeks. I think I would go insane. Yeah, Yeah, you literally do. It's it's so depressing. Did it take a toll on your mental health? Yes. Yeah, Yeah. I bet. Because you're like, you're just watching all the stuff that's going on at home. People are like, you you miss, you really end up like the little things like going out for dinner. I feel like if you don't have enough gratitude in your life, you're not thankful for Mm -hmm. what you got, you go do something like that. And then you're isolated from that and you just be glad to be able to go for dinner with your wife again. Or like, you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't take it for granted. Yeah. 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 So yeah. how did you end up here and uh, starting Cold War? Let's uh, get into it. Yeah. So I, when I, that company that we were building rigs for, when they were going to give me the promotion, we quit. And I wanted to start my own business. And I'd always done like little side businesses. Yeah. Aren't real things. Like we all just do shit. We yeah. sell whatever. Yeah. Like, Easter baskets or whatever. And yeah. Sell them. It's not a real company, but <laughs> stuff like that. I was selling. But the cars. money's real. So it's not <laughs> yeah, the yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so I was selling cars a lot, but I wanted to do a real thing. And so mm-hmm. my, I asked uh, three or four different mentors, like, what's the thing that I need to know? Cause I, you, know, you don't know anything. You're starting companies. I literally don't know anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they're the big, the, there's a lot of stuff they said, but the one thing that was a common theme was if you're planning on doing what you think you're going to do, which is this kind of do some larger scale stuff. You have to learn how to finance a company. So you didn't, you don't know corporate finance, and you don't know how to fund, and you don't know private equity, and you mm-hmm. don't know this. If you don't learn that to some level before you go do this, you you probably won't get far. And even if you do, you'll get it taken from you. Yeah. At a certain point. Mm-hmm. And so <clears throat> then I went and joined a basically a PE group, uh, like accelerator. It was it was kind of a weird thing, but you, we raise money, we build narratives for startups, raise money. And then get them off the ground and then do another one and do another one. Cool. So great spot. Yeah. To go do that. So then did that and then started Cold War and Raptor Rig. And so you that did that like you were an employee there or you took Cold War there? No, I was an employee there. Oh, to just learn. Yeah. That's yeah. Really and that's smart. actually that where really Aaron smart. and I met. Yeah. So Aww. yeah, at that at that place. And so learned from a lot of really smart people that fund startups and build them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's so you get to see it happen a bunch of times. Mm-hmm. And more importantly, you see like three or four of them don't work. What works, what for whatever yeah. reason, yeah. right? And so it was a really good experience. And then started Cold War, and I was like 2014 already. So. 20, so it's been nine years? Yeah. Wow. I know. What <laughs> sparky idea? I was planning on it being half that, but. Uh, and here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to entrepreneurship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're I, not halfway yet either. I feel <laughs> you on that. Right? I know, I know you guys too, like. Okay. So, yeah. we breathe yeah right <laughs> okay in the center startup life namaste start up life. we're grateful you need that yeah. yes. yes. follow the guy on instagram he's like let's be grateful fuckers have you seen that guy no oh, he's the best he's a it. yoga guy but he swears all the time he's yeah like, come on center with me fuckers yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we need yeah. we do yeah we yeah. do we need that like all the time. Mm-hmm. I I especially I need to come in this room and say the same thing to myself like every hour on mantras. The hour. Yeah, <laughs> mantra. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and sorry, so, I didn't mean to swear on here. I just realized uh, that we could beep it. It's okay. Oh, yeah, no. totally fine. We, we I don't know if we'll beep it. Probably not. We yeah. won't beep it. We won't We're all it. about being real humans here Good. and real we humans. Cuss. We're not robots. <laughs> I like it. Right. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah, we're probably gonna get yelled at on LinkedIn for not being professional, but it's okay. Who cares? <laughs> Um, okay, so what does Cold War do? Okay, so layman's terms, uh, you guys are familiar, everyone's kind of familiar with fracking. There's drilling and fracking, yeah. basically, two things. You drill a well, comes out, big drill, puts a hole in the ground. Fracking, they come, they pump a bunch of water or whatever, a bunch of stuff in the water, and they just break up the rock mm-hmm. underneath the ground so that it can release more natural gas or oil or whatever. Yep. Pretty straightforward. 
Um, the gap that we're filling is that the fracking, just like everything else, the fracking process over the last 10 years has gotten a lot more complex and the jobs have gotten bigger and the equipment's gotten more complex and all this stuff. When they started fracking, it was one well and they would just frack that well. And then they went to multi wells and there's a bunch in a mm-hmm. row and then they tried to get more efficient. So they're, you know, they're all like 10 companies out there, big companies, they're yeah. all doing a part of it. And they started like, oh, I got to do my part and then you do your part. And then they're like, well, what if we do our part on this well and you do your part on that well while we're doing this so we can go faster and we'll right. kind of jump over each other. And that's evolved to like now there's two of each of those companies doing stuff, right? And so it just gets more and more complex. And uh, from 2000 to 2015, when fracking was really like getting going in mm-hmm. that level of complexity, it was like a land grab. Like it, you know, it was good times for oil and gas. So that just means they're going as fast as they can. Yeah. Frack, mm-hmm. frack, frack, frack. And the operation got more complex, but no, in that type of an environment, there's not a lot of desire, especially in oil and gas, which is one of the like slowest industries to adopt technology. <laughs> we talk about it all the time. Right? Yeah. So you're, so yeah. already you have that. And then you have that there's not attention on it because there's money being made everywhere and they have to make more money. Then 2015 to now has been like this roller coaster of up and down and up and down, which has changed the sentiment mm-hmm. where people are like, okay, hey, hold on. We have to figure out how to make more with less get more automated, be more diligent, mm-hmm, more do efficient. all these things, yeah. be more efficient. And so the challenge that's arisen that's given us the opportunity is that in doing that, the oil companies are saying to all these companies on location, you got to send us all your data and we want to look at it. Mm-hmm. And so they all got control systems, which they didn't have really right. before. And they all started sending data to the oil company. And it's just, it's a, like a big mess. Because now you got multiple wells that are part of that data set. You got multiple companies sending you their version of what they did, mm-hmm. and they're trying to put it together, right, to make a complete picture. And I'm sure some of it like wow. doesn't match up, right. and it's all all over the place. Yeah, mm-hmm. it doesn't match up. And like the other thing is, like none of these guys are hard lined into each other. They're not sharing data in real time, right? Mm-hmm. Which is crazy, right? You're like thirty million dollar frack. They're not yeah. connected. <laughs> they're just like your turn, Bill. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's nuts. So. Which is so, like a walkie-talkie, like, all right. right. <laughs> that's that's actually what it is, walkie-talkie. Some of it. Oh, my gosh. I'm not kidding. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's some of it. It's actually advancing faster now where they're trying to do that. But still, so there's no connection. And all that data coming to the oil companies is really hard for them to do much with. Mm-hmm. They do what they can, but there's not a lot. And so we're just going out there and connecting all these companies. And we format all that data. So that it's one data set that's mm-hmm. usable and they can just look through our, they can log into our thing and it kind of agnostifies all the services out there and just brings it all into one program. Mm-hmm. So they can just click through screens and make relative analysis yeah, mm-hmm. and pull it all back. And then they just tell us, I need this to go into a database or I need to make analytics or reports or whatever. And so our business is about putting that infrastructure out there and maintaining right. it and then providing software development and services for all the service companies and the oil companies to start actually using infrastructure. That seems very helpful. Yeah. I think it is. (laughs) I mean, nine years later, it's obviously working. What are all the (laughs) other like softwares or other things that are like going into yours? Like what, where are they getting that data from, from the beginning that it's all being pushed into one place like yours? Like, are there some things that are like everyone uses? Yeah, I mean, it's just like it's the like to make it generic. There's control systems. Like everyone has their own equipment, mm-hmm. and then their own sensors on the equipment. We driving a number of things like pressures or rates right. or timestamps or whatever. But there's five of those companies with their own equipment with their own sensors that's coming into their own computers. They they don't necessarily have the format to talk. They don't mm-hmm. know how to connect, and so they just send it up to the cloud. Mm. And in the cloud, they try to make sense of it all. Right. But it's like different format, different program, different. It's like Excel and Word. I was going to say, yeah. It's like, let's try and make Excel and Word go together. It's like, yeah. I, I don't know how to do that. Right? right. And so they try their best to make it happen. When we go out there, it's like, okay, hey, here's the operating system. And we just sit below all those control systems. So when they show up now, they just snap on. And we have like the translator slash adapter. Yeah. And we built all that in. So now it just pulls all that. What is that? Data. What When you say that, is that like a hardware software? Like what is <laughs> the, the layer it's zero. A turtle. So that's layer zero. Yeah, you, yeah. It's a turtle. It's a turtle. <laughs> I talk with my hands a lot too. It's a turtle. I love it. Yeah. It's a good. It's a good visual. <laughs> so that we call it layer zero. That's what okay. we're, so the thing is that we had to find language to make this simple for people to understand. Right. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. even for oil and gas people, this is more of a software problem. Mm-hmm. So it's not obvious to a lot of oil and gas people. 
right? But they're now becoming software people because that's right. 2023. Yeah. Right. And so we use the term layer zero as like a foundation. If you have all these other companies out there that aren't connected, that's what your database is going to look like. Silos of messy data. Mm -hmm. Physical representation is what your data will end up, right? And so mm -hmm. if you put the foundation out there, the job of our actual box and cables is to connect everyone. And then the software in it generates its own timestamp for the whole pad. So gotcha. that makes the containers. Mm -hmm. And then we just take all the data from yeah. all those people and put them in the right container. Mm -hmm. And that way mm -hmm. now they all share and hit that sense. So wait, that's how you get it like live. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise, I mean, there's not internet out at some of these locations. No, they all have internet. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they all have cellular and satellite connection. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. But we do that too. So it's essentially like you're putting internet between all these guys. Mm -hmm. The key here is that they all have their own systems and stuff. It's just that it's a problem when you try and put it together mm -hmm. and the actual operation is one. Right. Mm -hmm. So the physical operation needs to be represented by the right. data and it's not currently. So when you try and you're an oil and gas engineer or something and you're like using this fragmented messed up data to mm -hmm. try to make calls that are going to change something in the operation, it doesn't line up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if we can just make that easy, then we can give right. them the data they need to make those calls and connecting all these guys, we can just let their computers talk. Yeah. Which then gets to all automated kinds of stuff. Okay. So let's walk through a day in the life of a, <laughs> no, of a customer of Cold War. Yeah. They want to get you out there. What does that look like? How do they get started? Yeah, we call, they, we talk to them and then they call us and say, we understand now they have to have a certain level of digital maturity to understand the problem. Because right. the, which most of them do now. Yeah. And so they'll call us and say, look, we got all these great companies that are service companies, the Halliburton, Slumberjays, Profrax, Liberties, like all those guys. Mm -hmm. They have great control systems and they do great jobs, but we need, we can't manage all the control mm -hmm. systems and the data. And so can you come out here and you put your layer zero out there, make a base layer to connect all of it, and then you bring it back to us and we'll log in through your system to see all of it at once. Got it, got it. Yeah. Okay. And then Easy. we'll tell you what we want with it after. Yeah. And you just develop that for us. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, you said something about... I didn't know this was a thing. Um, multi frack site. Does that mean like you're going in through one well and then you're fracking? Like, so I'm picturing like um, vertical, vertical, vertical. Mm -hmm. Then you're going in this first one and fracking all of them. Is that correct? No. So they're <laughs> kind of. No. Kind of uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's pretty close. So the multi the multi well pads just have a bunch of the vertical well, but all the wells are like most of these ones we're talking about have a vertical and a horizontal part. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they'll like when you look at a pad from the top down, they'll drill out in straight lines like this, so down and then out, mm -hmm. and then they'll kind of go around the edges this way and this way. It's just about getting the maximum amount of wells in that thin layer of right. uh, formation, and so they drill mm -hmm. out and they try to get all of it. Okay. And so. But when they're doing multi-well frack, they'll have like one company is working on the first well pumping mm -hmm. and the other company is doing wireline over here. Oh. And they do it in, they do this portion, like if this is the well, they do the end of it with wireline, they plug and perf, and then they leave because they only want to do a part of it. Right. And then they want to pump so they can frack, frack to yeah. it. Yeah. And then they want to, the pumpers will unhook and then they put the wireline back in and then they'll frack the next one. Mm. And then they'll do it in sections so they get the most amount because you can't like perf put a bunch of holes in the whole well and pump it'll all grow out the first hole right, right. so you gotta start at the end and work your way back got it, got it. in okay. sections i feel like we need a video of this like an animation yeah, i know where's yeah. boss all yeah, boss yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> get in your boss make us a video <laughs> yeah so when they do that so the way they made it a lot more efficient is they'll put like eight wells in a row mm -hmm. and then they'll start that first section and do their turn and then they'll go to the other one and then they'll come, the companies all switch. It's called Zipper Frack. Mm -hmm. Zipper Frack? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fun. That's a fun word. What's a fun term? <laughs> we haven't heard of that. We know that's a new term. <laughs> no. Okay. That's a new term. There's Zipper Frack, there's that's Simul Frack, there's Dual Frack. There wow. Are all kinds of fracks. I like I'm going to have to most. add this to our glossary. I know. And Notion. Mm -hmm. I know. So it's funny. My dad worked at Halliburton and he created, uh, he was a part of making many of the tools for fracking. They actually referred to him as, I can't remember, it's like king of frack or king of fracking, something like that, like something like crazy like that. And it's so funny because I know nothing. I'm like, dad, why didn't you teach me anything? <laughs> he was, he, was he a boss man at Halliburton? <clears throat> he wasn't like in the C-suite, but he was pretty high up. Yeah. He was there for 40 years. 
What? Jeez. Yeah. That's big time. And what's he doing now? He's retired? He's retired. He retired in 2019. Oh. Want to hear a funny story about Halburn? I do. <laughs> Seems like that's your dad? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I have a not funny story. I had another drilling company where I was one of four founders that we built these automated drilling rigs. This was five years ago. And... We were funding that company and we built like these $30 million rigs and all this crap. And it was like a big deal. And we owned a big, I owned a big part of that company. And my partners all knew the guys at Halliburton and they're like, oh, we want to do this that, and we'll just get them to be the funders of it. I'm like, no, we don't want to have one investor. Yeah. And that's the end of that story. So it went like a year and then that company was over. Overnight. Post. COVID hit and it was roasted. Oh, no. It just got, just got banked. Yeah. And that, Wait, it was automated rigs? Yeah. Raptor rig. That would have been really cool. Very cool. Yep. So that one's like moving on, but <laughs> we lost a lot of Are you of money. okay? Yeah. Are you fine? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so okay, that's, but now the funny story. So Halliburton's Western Hemisphere president lives across the street from me. And I didn't know that in Heights and just moved in there. And they're obviously a big company that we work, that we work yeah. with. And we were going to rodeo. And so I picked up a bunch of my guys and we were in the truck, went and got a bunch of beer and we went and bought our cowboy hats and our little boots and all this stuff. <laughs> How Texas of you. Yeah. I, love yeah. I love it. Right? Like we got the Ariats and I got, the, I got everything, the Wranglers. So we're yeah, dressed like the God. tags are still on all of our clothes. <laughs> and we got all of us dressed up like idiots. Like we're ready to go. Cases of beer, Morgan Wallen on it, like full volume. Come around the corner in the truck and there's a bunch of people waiting at the house to get in because it was locked. And we were all having a few drinks yeah. in the backyard before we went. And so we rip up and the truck pulls out and we get beer everywhere. And we're like dumping all the cases like it's ridiculous. Like dumb and dumber. <laughs> <laughs> right? Essentials only. And there's this other guy standing there and we start talking and he could see I have these neon lights in my in my office house. We have a tech house that doubles. Oh, nice. And so it says Colborn and all that. And he had looked it up and he said, oh, we started chatting. He's like, oh, I live across the street. I'm like, cool. And he's like, I saw your thing. You're in fracking or something like that. I'm like, yeah, we do fracking. He's like, what frack companies do you work with? And I'm like, oh, Profrac. Liberty, Halliburton, and he's like, oh, yeah, what about Halliburton? Do you, like, what do you do with them? Like, I don't know. Like, who would even know who to talk to with that company? We work with them, but, like, it's a waste of time. It's impossible. <laughs> I can't figure out who to talk to there. And he's like, how about the second? He's like, I'm your guy. <laughs> I'm like, oh, and I put like my two cases of beer down. And you're, then, like, you're like, hello. Hi, nice to meet you, sir. <laughs> so I'll leave his name off here, but he's like a super nice guy. And he, he's just like a really good dude. But yeah. that's the funny story. He was like top dog. Wait, that's that hilarious. hilarious. Yeah. 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 Did he, was he like, I'm sold? Oh, no. Oh. No. <laughs> but we didn't even talk more about that. I did talk to him. I got his number. We're going to go for lunch. And good, like, he's, good, when good. we're ready, like he's, he's so high up that yeah. it's got to be a, the right thing in the right time. Yeah. I'm sure he's in He'll pick me in there and go do a thing, but I got to be prepared for it. Yeah. That's kind of guy. You redeem want. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally redeem <laughs> yourself. Yeah. He was really nice. Though. It was like, took two seconds and I was like, oh man, that's embarrassing. He's like, dude, who cares? Like, oh, that's, that's cool. That that's cool. cool. Yeah. I love that. Um, do we have any more questions? Not other than our fun ones. I know. Do you? Oh, God. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Where's Jules when you need her? The first one is, um, why what? should we care about mm -hmm. energy and oil and gas? Yeah. Like, as people mm -hmm. who maybe minus Julie, because she's from Midland. And, yeah. Married. But, married to the game. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but as we were talking earlier, you know, people outside of Texas, outside of the industry, why should they care? I mean, that's a good question because it's hard to convince anybody, mm -hmm. I think, if you're not interested. If people yeah. are like, why should I care about windmills? And you can talk till you're blue in the face and I'm still not going to care. So that's a tricky question. But I think the one thing that's different about that, like, why do I care about solar? It just depends on what you're more inclined yeah. to care about. Like, if I care about the environment, if I care about this, care about other things. Right. Where I think people could, if you really do are interested in solar or with, like the environmentists in general and alternatives or making it better. The cool thing about oil and gas that a lot of people don't know is that it's kind of just painted broadly as like, okay, that's the bad thing. Right. We have to get rid of it because that's what's killing the planet. That's so not true at all. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. And so my partner, uh, Toby Rice, who's, who's kind of a well-known guy in oil and gas, no one outside <laughs> of it will know who he is, but um, he's got this big initiative that he's one educating the market on a lot of this stuff. So I forget the exact numbers, but if there's liquefied natural gas, which a lot of people don't know about, it's kind yeah. of technical, but you use it for power generation and it's really clean burning, like compared to coal, compared yeah. to like any alternative that we have that would be used at scale. I think that was his keynote at Fuse last year. Yes. Mm -hmm. Unleashing. Mm -hmm. 
Only Unleash American. American. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, this yeah, is yeah. the thing. Why should anybody who doesn't know about oil and gas care? Mm-hmm. If you do really want to make a difference and not just kind of go along with this narrative that politicians are on about all the time, like it's so just droning on about kill this and do this and kill that and do that. Like California, make everything electric and all the cars. Okay. We can't even support it. The grid can't do it. It's not even feasible, all this stuff. And how do we really actually make an impact globally? It's LNG. Mm -hmm. China and India, like we can do everything we want here, but if we focused on helping China and India have the same energy revolution that we did that made the West rich which was like we found these fossil fuels, oil and gas, and we capitalized on the industrial revolution and we became rich. They haven't had that revolution yet. And so people don't know that really, but you go over there and you're like, you should get on solar panels and windmills. They're like, we got, what? (laughs) We haven't even had our industrial revolution yet. Like, like, what are you talking about? We're still in poverty. Yeah, Yeah, we don't have energy yet. We're going to get rich off the same thing you did first. Mm -hmm. Then we'll talk about that, which is totally fair. Yeah. But they're all burning coal still because they don't have LNG. Right. That's mm-hmm. so if we could get those huge populations just switched over to LNG and if everyone knew this and could support this, we would become incredibly wealthy nation, really powerful, and we would get meet the global emissions targets because green is not by country, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. so we could meet global emissions targets like within a short amount of time. We could do this now. Wow. Turn it online, build the plants, shut down the coal, get them on LNG, get rich, increase their quality of life, and meet all the targets. And no politician talks about this, but it's like 1,000% doable. Wow. Yeah. That's why. That's going to make a great TikTok. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> TikTok. I have to turn mine on. Yeah. You should. I don't have it. It's good. Um, you'll have people calling you out for... All of it. Yeah, there's lots of, there's actually a very um, big like field presence. There is. Oil and gas. Like people will always go on there and call Colin stupid for his roughneck videos. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know. Though every, the whole time I'm talking about this, you go back and listen later, you're like, I said that wrong. Yeah. Oh, I didn't make that detail. I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. That's how you get engagement though. So Mm -hmm. you just go. You also kind of answered our second question because normally we ask, What's the biggest misconception? So I feel like you were like two birds, one stone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a huge one. I mean, I think what Toby's doing is honestly yeah. one of the most important things that's going on in the U.S. right now. But it's just so hard because yeah. politically the game is just different. Mm-hmm. They're not really about what actually works. They're about how to keep their, their political party in power. Uh-huh. There's just too much. You got to understand it's just like global economics, you got to understand politics, you got to understand energy, and you got to understand environmentalism. If you're going to put it all together, then you'll yeah. understand why and how it's all kind of going that way. Right. But like you said, most people just that's. Don't. I think that's one of our biggest missions. And me personally, one thing that I want to get better at is understanding broader energy, so I can apply that knowledge to politics and see where they're really wrong. Um, obviously, there's a base layer I already know. Yeah. Um, but really understand why behind decisions and you know be educated (laughs) yeah it's i mean so michael schellenberger great reference if you guys want to start reading books he's kind of like he's a brilliant guy that was a democrat that like staunch has become a republican because he's starting to unpack all this stuff but he talks on environmentalism on economics and it's the most educated books and discussions i've ever seen like the guy's an animal wow so what's it called michael schellenberger is the guy michael schellenberger and then he has like um Apocalypse Never is his environmentalism book. He talks about all the fallacies of all this stuff. And then there's San Francisco, which is talking about Democrat-run cities and why they're always the ones that are yeah. destroyed. And Terrible. Yeah. Yeah. And so he gives you, but yeah. he's, and follows Instagram too, because it's, it's, that's a good resource if you just want to consume stuff fast and get a broad cool. spectrum. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's a lot. Yeah. It's like you got to be interested in it. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. Last question. This is, is the fun one. Your most embarrassing story in your career. <laughs> which you may have already oh, this is funny. That one too. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah this is funny because i haven't thought of this in so long and it jumped to the front of my mind immediately <laughs> i can't wait <laughs> okay so uh when i first started with at the like ta- at the finance place where we're doing private equity and venture capital and all that stuff they're like okay we got to build some we're going to teach you how to build a narrative a financial narrative for a tech company so you get a company then you're like this is what the company wants to do for a product and a market but you got to, what's the story you're going to tell to get investors interested? Because mm-hmm. that's different than the one you're going to tell your customers. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And so building financial narratives have all these things with it. And we do that for a while and kind of learn. And you're like, oh, okay. So this, this financial narrative will look like this. And this is the size of the company with the amount of money we're going to raise. 
that means it goes to very specific type of people. Like private equity guys are different than VCs are different than X, Y, and Z. Right. And so then you learn who to go to and they let you build that. And then they're like, hey, now we got to raise a little bit of money. And then you go sit in meetings with people and you watch them do the pitches to raise the money and do all this stuff. And eventually the day comes where you got to, you're the one. Like you are going on your own. And so that first pitch I ever did was for a really cool company, but I went into the boardroom and it just happened to be that I called a big PE firm and they lined up a pretty full room, which you don't really want. <laughs> <laughs> for the reason you're about to tell us. Uh-huh. And, uh, you want more like one or two guys at a coffee shop for the first 20 is what I learned. But my personality is like, I'm just going straight for the top. I'm hitting a home run first one. So it's like, imagine like it wasn't this, but imagine like a JP Morgan Chase top floor with like a oak table with 20 mm-hmm. chairs and it's full of bankers. And because it was a good deal, right? And I won't say the name of the deal, but it was a big deal like to do with satellites and yeah. cameras and all this stuff. But, and multiple people were working on it. But, and so they were interested. They had heard of it. But I was the Goomba that was going there to talk to them. <laughs> and so... <laughs> I went and did the whole like talk about the camera. So it's all good and they're all interested. And then they're asking questions and I'm dressed like I still had those suits where it looks like you're going to a court date instead of mm. going to a business meeting. Like they're too big. <laughs> it's like square. <laughs> right? Ties like in a little yes. tiny knot. that's just tight. <laughs> and did my thing. And they're like, okay, this is great, Brett. So what, like how much money are you looking to raise? And all that? I'm like, we're getting, raising $5 million in the first round. Very legit. I'm just remembering all my numbers, like five million in the first round, and our evaluation is twenty million dollars for this company. And it was like dead quiet. And I'm like, oh no. And they all kind of start closing their books. A bunch of guys just get up and leave. One of the guys <laughs> comes over and grabs my my hand like this. He's like, We know this is like one of your first ones, we're early on this, but it's valuation, not evaluation. <laughs> You evaluate <laughs> to give a value. <laughs> You're like, thanks for coming in. <laughs> I'm like. Wait, I probably would have said the same thing. Evaluate. Everyone does. Right? <laughs> you got that far. And that was it. it Did you like, feel like you like nailed it too? Like you said it and you were like, I got it. No, you I knew. knew. You knew? You knew? I, I was like, so just go out the same door I came in or. I'm just going to jump. <laughs> You're like, or I'm going to jump out the window. Yeah, keep the pen in the book. Taking this. <laughs> Uh, it was the most mortifying thing in my Were life. Were you like beat red? Yep. It was pretty embarrassing. <laughs> I, I love like, <laughs> whole pity party that night for the whole night. I'm I like, love that someone came over and was like, I know, like Hilter. Yeah. Thing, you know, honey, thanks for coming. Honey, so cute. That was great. Okay. Never give up. <laughs> a little, t- a little but, tip for you. <laughs> here's the thing. You're an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get discouraged. You're great. Oh, I love it. <laughs> These keep getting That's better. I know. It's my I favorite part it. of every episode. Mm-hmm. My favorite is to watch people like you can see a story come into their head mm-hmm. immediately and they're like, oh, wait, I can't tell that. <laughs> like, yeah, they're like no, a little. Tell that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. This is a judgment free zone. <laughs> oh, man, this is like there's um, we've been doing if you've been doing this long enough, there's like I could go. There's 50,000 mm-hmm. other failures. There's like you're basically just a failure if you <laughs> yeah. do entrepreneurial stuff. <laughs> Until you're not. Yeah. No, that, until you're that not. Until you're not that day is like one day and it's yeah. later. Yeah. And you're like, Sometime. Huh. Eventually. <laughs> yeah. Eventually. Eventually. Maybe. You just get used to it. It's not a thing anymore. Yeah. You don't you fail. You learn. It. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Great. This is a really fun episode. This was a good yeah. episode. Yeah. Thank you so What much. do we have coming out? What do we need to plug? Um, what is this going to plug? Well, this will come out probably on Energy Tech Night in Midland. So. Oh, great. So tonight is <laughs> Energy Tech Night Fun. in Midland, but we have one more coming up, Oklahoma City, August 10th. Yes. I think that's it. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Love it. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you. Bye. Wait, should we say where to find you? Oh, um, yeah. yeah. On, we're, the we're in the on the internet. I'm on the internet. I'm on the internet. It's easy to find. I'm annoying on there. I have right, everything yeah. everywhere. Yeah. You can Great. just Google Cobor, CobortTechnology.com, Instagram, LinkedIn. I'm all of it. Yeah, Coldboard puts out some really good content. Like y'all are killing it with the content game. Um, other Thank companies you. should definitely mm-hmm. follow suit. Mm-hmm. It's fun. We just like doing it. Yeah. yeah. I love y'all's team. Like John and Lee, I saw them. They came to Energy Tech Night in Houston and they were telling me we need to get you on. This yeah. Podcast. That's awesome. Yeah, they're, they're so good. Guys. Yeah. You're such good people. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, cool. Check awesome. them out. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, guys. <laughs>